My name is Jamie Stevens. I'm an associate professor uh, in the Department of Biosciences up at uh, Exeter University. Um, and my co-author and lead uh, author on this paper is Tom Jenkins. Um, and he was a postdoc for a long time in my lab. I've had a long standing interest in understanding where pink sea fans are likely to be found. Um, I've posed myself a lot of um, kind of questions about where they should be and where they are and where they aren't. Um, and they always kind of surprise me. And you find them in some very odd places that you might not expect. Um, the obvious thing is that you people associate them with high tidal zones. I don't think that's quite correct. Their localized requirements are a little more subtle than that. They often like to be just slightly out of the current um, where they can uh, feed as you know marine detritus. Um, but it's a long-standing question within my research group um, and part of Tom's PhD a few years back in trying to understand where exactly you do find them and where you don't find them and kind of why is that important? Um, from our perspective it's important because they are one of our few kind of um, charismatic shallow, shallow water coral species um, and they are one of the few species that provide a bit of three-dimensionality to a temperate reef system over and above things like the natural rugosity of a reef and of course things like kelp. Um, but aside from those um, they're one of the only organisms that provides any kind of static three-dimensionality and that three-dimensionality then leads to increases in diversity through providing a platform for various anemones, some of which are associated specifically with the sea fan, um, uh, nudibranchs, um, and then the sea fans themselves can form uh, anchorage points for the um, egg cases, the mermaids' purses of various dogfish, skates and rays. So they, they play quite a, you know, they're more than just a they're more than just an iconic species as one of our few kind of um, enigmatic and, and, and pretty coral species. They actually do something within the reef ecosystem as well. Kind of have a distribution that from our perspective is very much Southwest Britain. Um, and uh, there is a population um, in um, Pembrokeshire in Southwest Wales. Um, and we, I, I became very interested in understanding kind of why they are where they are, but why they stop pretty abruptly, actually. Um, they stop very abruptly around um, uh, Portland in the, on the north side of the English Channel. Um, and if you know anything about that area, it's a kind of dividing line. Um, it faces the Cotentin Peninsula on the French side. And east of that, the channel is much shallower and it gets much colder in winter. West of that, the influence is much more maritime and the, the temperature is much more stable throughout the season. Then you've got the Pembrokeshire population in Wales. Again, it's, it's very much, um, uh, it's a very much a range edge population. And to the north of it is the Irish Sea, which again experiences somewhat colder conditions in the winter. And then on the west coast of Ireland, they actually move quite a bit further up. They move further up, um, uh, to Donegal Bay, in fact, to the northernmost county um, in Ireland. So you get this kind of diagonal line um, if you draw an isotherm, a marine isotherm, um, across their distribution. And it marries up very nicely uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an in-sea uh, thermocline there. So I was interested for a long time in trying to understand, you know, what is that real or is that are there other factors limiting, um, limiting their, their distribution? And so Tom, who is a very clever programmer, set about kind of writing some programs and some scripts uh, and digging out some data to allow us to kind of look at this question in more detail. And um, what, the model, he, you know, the, what the model was able to do um, was to identify, identify a series of parameters which appear to be quite influential in dictating uh, the, the, the distribution. So this is based on um, a model which works with data on presence and absence, not always easy data to work with, particularly confirmed absences, but pink sea fan is quite well recorded by people like Sea Search and amateur divers, and it's relatively easy to spot and, and relatively difficult to confuse with other species. So we have quite good records of where it is. And also importantly, we have records of where it isn't. 
And then the model set out to kind of be able to predict the current day distribution. And if the model was able to do that with the parameters that we have, the next step was to kind of turn the temperature up a bit or play around with some of the other parameters because it, it's not just temperature that seems to define the distribution. And to then to see what happens when we move kind of to the end of this century and early into the next century. And that's where it gets more interesting. So the model did very well on predicting um, the distribution of um, pink sea fan and um, this other species, dead man's fingers, within current distribution. There are some areas, particularly in the northern parts, where um, we see what should be suitable habitat where we don't have current uh, observations of the fans. That could be down to connectivity. It could be due to a lack of larvae reaching those areas. It could be that we don't understand all aspects of, well, it's almost certainly the case that we don't understand all aspects of, of the things that dictate where these um, soft corals can and can't live, or more particularly where the larvae of these um, soft corals can and can't settle successfully, because that's ultimately what allows them to spread. It's, you know, they're, they're otherwise sessile marine invertebrates, so they're entirely dependent on their larval uh, dispersal. Um, and having got the present day distribution, and you can see all that in the paper, um, we then set about modeling um, the, what, would, what, what might happen in the future. And what we found was um, that actually, um, things like slope, um, uh, orbital velocity of waves um, and temperature all play an important part in predicting, um, giving us an insight into where suitable habitat might come up as things change and particularly as temperature changes. And what we saw was quite a, quite a marked range expansion to the north for pink sea fan. So one of the things that the model uh, shows is the obvious thing that, 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 that has perhaps caught the eye of, of, of various people is the range expansion in the north. But pleasingly from our perspective is that um, conditions, particularly related to temperature and of course the other uh, parameters in the model, uh, suggest that at least in the next uh, 80 plus years, those conditions are gonna stay stable enough um, that we will see um, fans continuing to prosper and thrive in the southern part of the distribution around um, Britain, Ireland and Northern Europe. One of the other thing, interesting things uh, about um, pink sea fan that we see uh, is from a genetic perspective, and we have a lot of genetic work going on in my group, and we see um, some, we see the sea fans around uh, England and Wales and even over into France have um, relatively sort of common uh, shared genotypes. But over on the west coast of Ireland, we see some sea fans that have really quite um, distinctive genetic makeup. And what we're doing at the moment is kind of exploring that in a little more detail and carrying out um, some experiments to try and understand how temperature uh, may be kind of influencing uh, the, the different genetic forms of the sea fan that we see uh, both in England, Wales, uh, and as I said, over on the west coast of Ireland. So there's some nice work being carried out by um, one of my team, um, uh, Kirsty McLeod, uh, and we would hope to see that out within um, the next few months.